We are just about set to go with our next presentation. Dennis Bray is an active professor emeritus at Cambridge University. He has a recent book out called Wetware, A Computer in Every Cell, which describes the computational processes inside cells. He's going to talk to us today a little bit about we're look, how we're looking to robotics when we should actually be looking to the computing powers of biology to solve our problems. Please join me in welcoming Dennis Bray. Thank you. Is this on now? Yes. Okay. So this is my first AI conference, and uh, it's been a really uh, illuminating experience. And uh, old as I am, I, I feel carried along by the enthusiasm of the audience. And it's just amazing that you're still here at the end of the day. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Is the projector on? So it's, it's amazing to me just, just what uh, has been achieved and, and, uh, with uh, intelligent machines and even more what is, is, is possible in the future. But as a card-carrying uh, cell biologist, I feel it's my, uh, my loyalty is to the carbon-based systems. And uh, I have to point out that, uh, amazingly, uh, although the future is, is, is incredibly attractive, that um, artificial mach machines still ha ha uh, can't do everything. So uh, ro robots. Are, are very efficient at performing um, <coughs> well-defined tasks. Um, but uh, in, in a real-world situation, I'm far less effective. So, for example, even something as simple as, as reaching out to a bottle of milk and pouring it into a cup is a real challenge for a robot. And things like um, asking a robot to play a good game of tennis or to cook a meal from scratch. And in particular, things such as read a, a newspaper and understand what it says are beyond the reach of present-day robots. And this is, a, this is a, a puzzle, really, because for the last 50 years, people have been pr predicting that our world would be populated by sentient robots that would be essentially interacting with humans uh, almost as equals. So the question is, what, what, what's, gotten, what's gone wrong? Why aren't we much further along in the development than we are? <clears throat> so I, I, I'd like to suggest that there are two reasons. One is that we actually don't understand how the humans perform these tasks. And perhaps that's something we could defer to, to afterwards to, to the debate with, with Terry. But the second thing that uh, I'd like to uh, talk about just in the next 15 minutes is that it seems to me that the, the hardware that's employed in, in constructing <coughs> uh, intelligent machines, robots, is not up to the task that it's been set. Let me explain what I mean. So, um, living cells are... I lost my pointer. Can I have a, a pointer there, please? Thank you. Living, living cells are uh, very small chambers, membrane-enclosed chambers, containing a highly complicated uh, bag of chemicals. So this is a bacterium, E. coli. It's about two microns long. Uh, and it's got a, a lipid membrane. And within the li lipid membrane, there's a, a, a very complicated mixture of chemicals, including DNA, the green. But 
the, a large part of the uh, contents are uh, proteins. Proteins uh, make the flagella by which the, the bacterium swims. Uh, they form the uh, receptors that are inserted in the membrane uh, by which it senses its environment. And everything in between, uh, in involving the swimming, the sensing, and also the metabolism and the division, uh, uh, proteins play a major part. And just to give you some parameters, uh, E. coli contains about 10 to the 9 protein molecules. And these are made from a set of uh, just over 4,300 genes. The number is known rather precisely, although, strangely enough, not, not all the functions of the proteins are, are completely understood. By contrast, the cells in your body, uh, each one is about 1,000 times larger in volume and in content, so they have about 10 to the 12th protein molecules. The number of genes is much larger, but perhaps not as large as you might expect. Certainly, it was a su surprise to find when the Human Genome Project was finished that it's, it's of the order of 25,000. And uh, something I, I, I hope to return to uh, later, in fact, less than a 2% of the human genome actually uh, encodes the protein. So a, a large proportion of the DNA is, is doing something else. Proteins, as I'm sure you know, are uh, made in the cell as a, a linear chain of amino acids, which are, the sequence of which has been selected by evolution so that they fold up in, into a precise shape. And this, this molecule has a surface lattice of atoms which have been selected by evolution. So that they have binding sites to which a particular other molecules bind and uh, selectively uh, uh, recognized by the protein. So this, this simple enzyme, hexakinase, has a binding site on its surface for glucose and ATP. It binds these two in close proximity and in such a conf for me, uh, configuration that a reaction between the two is, is promoted. Everything happens very fast at the molecular level. So in the cell, hexakinase is diffusing around, encountering glucose and ATP, and spitting out the product, which is phosphorylated glucose. So you can think of it as a pipeline, a chemical pipeline that's taking in uh, glucose and spitting out glucose phosphate. And of course, the rate uh, varies with the uh, concentrations of starting material. Another feature of the protein is that uh, it, it, uh, almost all proteins have more than one binding site. And uh, they have regulatory sites <coughs> to which other molecules can bind and uh, either activate or inhibit the process of the enzyme. And the important feature is that these second regulatory sites have no necessary relationship to the structure of the substrate, in this case, glucose. So you c that means that during evolution, you can, you can um, wire up any two processes in the cell. <clears throat> that's, that's convenient and which is, provides you an, with an advantage. So it's possible to think of, of uh, enzymes and other proteins in the cells as computational units. And this is drawing some uh, uh, proteins in, in the form of perceptrons, um, in which you have a number of inputs which are combined to produce an output. So hexakinase has glucose and ATP and spits out glucose 6-phosphate. Uh, over there, uh, uh, aspartate transcarbamylase is one of the classic uh, allosteric enzymes. That binds uh, two small molecules and fuses them to form uh, uh, another molecule. And it also uh, has a binding site for CTP. CTP is not a product of the enzyme. It's actually a product of a whole chain of enzymes. It's one of the precursors of DNA. And CTP is, acts as a, an, a feedback inhibition on this enzyme, uh, thereby controlling the flux through the entire pathway. And this feedback inhibition is almost universal in, in, in cell metabolism. Two proteins of interest in the nervous system here. First of all, there's an NMDA receptor inserted in the membrane of central nervous system uh, synapses, which uh, uh, binds to glutamate. Uh, and uh, opens channels to allow calcium into the cell. Uh, but it only does that uh, when the rec receiving cell is, uh, the voltage changes. 
And so it's a coincidence between a voltage change and a, a, a sudden influx of glutamate that enables this, this, this receptor to open. And um, it's widely thought that the MNDA receptor uh, underlies the ability of, of uh, learning of many synapses to act as a, a heavy in synapse. When the calcium enters the synapse, it uh, uh, produces a, a large number of changes, many of which are mediated by this kinase as a protein that binds to the calcium, carried by calmodulin, and then phosphorylates a large number of other proteins. Phosphorylation, adding of a phosphate, is another way to uh, switch a protein on or off. And included in the targets of this uh, enzyme is uh, CAM2 kinase itself. And if the calcium uh, signal is large enough, CAM2 kinase becomes switched on and then is, from that point on is indifferent to the uh, level of calcium. So it's, it's, it's like a, a toggle switch and it's, it's widely believed that CAM2 kinase is a component of long-term potentiation and uh, memory in the, in the brain. Uh, CAM2 kinase uh, acts as a, a spreads a, a signal over a large number of targets. It's also true that there, uh, some proteins receive targets from a large number of other sources. So this is a protein involved in uh, making glycogen. Now I've drawn it as a, uh, in, in a form of a chip here. That has a large number, that has a dozen or so sites on its surface which can receive phosphate groups. These are added by a number of different kinases, each of which is responding to a different feature of metabolism. Uh, and um, it's, the, it's the net number of these phosphate groups and to some extent the particular ones which are um, determine the activity of the enzyme. So this, this single protein is itself an integrating device which <coughs> um, can uh, collect information and produce produce an output. Now clearly, uh, even though individual proteins uh, uh, are very, uh, very clever in, in what they can do, if you put uh, different proteins together, then you can form small networks uh, or complexes which are uh, uh, even more sophisticated. And um, indeed, it's well known that uh, networks of proteins perform all of the sort of kind of elementary processing that one's familiar with in um, microcircuits, so they amplify, they uh, provide coincidence uh, detection, they can pr produce oscillations, and they store memory. All of these things have been demonstrated, and they exist in cells, and they can be re reconstructed from purified components. Just to give you a taste, um, uh, here's an example from uh, a blue-green algae, remarkable situation where three proteins uh, generate a circadian rhythm, a 24-hour um, uh, rhythm. So what happens is that chi C uh, uh, binds to chi A and that stimulates chi C to add phosphate groups uh, to three sites on this, uh, on this protein. And as they're, um, and thus, as they're added, there comes a point when uh, chi B now finds a binding site Chi B now binds and uh, causes a change in Chi C which releases Chi A. Now at this point the, the phosphate groups start to stop, to stop being added and they start to fall off from the, from the molecule. And as they fall off there comes a point when Chi B falls off, Chi A comes back on and the whole cycle repeats. And uh, on, on, on the right there you can see experimental data showing the rise and fall of total phosphate groups and in particular phosphate groups. Slightly more complicated network in, in E. coli, this, this is the one I, I, I work on in particular. So this is the uh, network drawn as in, in, in a perceptron kind of way of uh, the receptors that uh, sense uh, uh, nutrients and other molecules in the surroundings of a bacterium and modulate the, the swimming. So these, these four kinds of receptors between them pass the chemical universe of interest to the bacterium. And they all feed into this, this protein here, A, which is a kinase. And depending on the level of, of phosphorylation, that passes a phosphate group to uh, a, a protein key Y, which diffuses to the motor and changes the swimming. Two other proteins here, R and B, 
work on a slower time scale and they feed back on the receptors and methylate it depending on whether they're occupied or not. And they constitute a short-term memory that's essential for the functional, uh, functioning of the bacteria and the its ability to move up gradients. Now that's bacteria. Now obviously in eukaryotes you have very much more complicated systems and this is just uh, uh, an attempt by Catano's lab to portray the many interactions that are produced by the binding of one growth factor, EGF, uh, to, to uh, uh, a, a tissue cell. And although I've just been concentrating on proteins, it's clear that um, proteins also interact with uh, DNA in particular, and some of the most complicated pro uh, computations that cells perform are those which are involved in uh, <clears throat> the changes during development, the development of a, of a higher animal, for example, involves the switching on and off of genes. And this is just a, a, a simplified uh, picture of one small part of the sea urchin development. Each of the banded arrows, if you can see them uh, there, is a gene, which, uh, uh, and all of the uh, arrows coming into those genes are regulatory, known regulatory influences which come from, from other genes in the system. Um, so it's highly complicated and, and indeed this regulatory level is much more plastic uh, during evolution than, than other forms. Okay, so uh, I hope this sort of very quick description is enough to convince you that living cells contain uh, large numbers of uh, what one can, can think of as computational elements, and certainly if one can, uh, can transfer from chemical, trans, uh, chemical transformations to, to the analogous uh, events in a, in a microcircuit which involves the flow of electrons. And it's, uh, it's possible to model these, all of everything I've set up till now, it's possible to model uh, either on a computer or e even if you, if you wish in, in, in electronic hardware. But there are also things in cells which are not uh, so easily modeled and which, uh, uh, at least to date, don't, don't feature in any, um, any uh, uh, hardware that I'm aware of. So uh, to begin with, let's consider the input and output to uh, uh, um, the brain. The input, you have sensory structures and the output you have mainly muscle. So this is uh, actually a, a, a micrograph of uh, muscle. This is actually in insect flight muscle, uh, showing structures built of a large number of, of protein molecules. Actually, there's hundreds of there. But uh, two main ones, the, the gold uh, is a filament made of one kind of protein called myosin, and the silver is a filament made of actin. And as I'm sure you know, these two interact with the cleavage of ATP. They're able to slide over each other uh, in a process that's regulated by calcium and produces contraction. And it's an e amazingly fast and efficient mechanism. Now, as far as I know, it, 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 it might be possible to, to build a nano machine which uh, performs perhaps not as, as efficiently, but you could... You could uh, try to mimic the action of a muscle, certainly using <coughs> silicon or other uh, uh, materials. But what you most assuredly would not be able to do would be to make a structure that was as uh, plastic and responsive as a real muscle. Now, if we think of a human muscle, in a newborn, that might be a centimeter long, <coughs> and it might grow to, let's say, 10 centimeters in the adult. Throughout that entire period, that muscle is functioning in, in a way that's appropriate to the, the size of the body it finds itself in. It responds to uh, exercise, it, uh, it responds to disuse. If it's injured, uh, it can repair itself. Now, wh what is it about this, this structure that enables this to, to occur? Well, one of the features is that it's not a static structure. Although it looks very regular, uh, almost crystalline, the fact is that the molecules in, in, in any muscle are actually turning over. They're turning over with a half time of perhaps uh, a number of days or even weeks. So that uh, any changes, so that enables the thing to, to grow while still generating force.
support, but even more importantly, it enables the muscle to change its nature uh, according to requirements. Uh, and it's, it, it may be relevant that the, the, the structures that actually build the, the muscle, and the true, same is true for sensory structures, are actually the same components, proteins, that are involved in the processing. So then it's not a separate, uh, separate um, system from the computational system. It's actually embedded in the whole, uh, 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 whole set, uh, system. Now, an even more important feature, perhaps, is that when the, the, when the proteins are turning over in a muscle, they're not necessarily replaced in the same form. And that leads me to, perhaps, the most important feature of real cells, and that is that they're, um, they're very variable. Now, the, I, I mentioned that there are 20, something like 25,000 genes in a human uh, encoding protein. But the actual number of distinguishable proteins that a human cell makes is vastly more than that. In fact, it's, it's essentially uncountable. And one of the reasons I've already alluded to is that after proteins are made, they, they can be modified in a whole variety of ways. So I mentioned the protein that was, had received uh, a, a number of phosphate groups. Here's, here's another example. This is a, a little bit of that uh, receptor, cluster of receptors in, a, in the bacterium. This is the outside of the bacterium, so it's seeing all of the, the chemicals uh, that the bacterium is swimming through. These are binding to the receptors. Here's the membrane, and depending on whether the particular receptor is binding to a, 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 a serine or a spartate, that receptor changes its conformation, and that conformation is transferred down to the, the, the kinase, as I mentioned. Now, these dots, which are, you see on the, uh, on the receptors, are actually sites to which methyl groups are, are, can be added. And there's actually eight of these for each of these receptors. And, depend, and these are, the, these are the, essentially the memory uh, of the bacterium. So the more the bacterium has ex been exposed to some nutrient, the higher the number of meth methyl groups. And the higher the number of methyl groups, so that modifies the, the output from this system. So uh, I'm sure people here could, can calculate it very easily, but uh, if you have thousands of receptors, each receptor has eight potential sites of methylation, and there's actually four kinds of receptors. If you, if you, if you go through the combinatorics, you'll, you'll see that the, the, the number of states of this small cluster of receptors is astronomical. Now, clearly not all of them are important. Uh, much of this is just purely chemical noise. But some of it, most assuredly, is important. And, uh, uh, and if any particular combination of methylation states uh, occurred, uh, was correlated with some important event in the life of the bacterium, then we can be sure that it would make use of this. And uh, in parenthesis, I add that I'd like to add that the, uh, the, the size of the receptor cluster in a, in, a recept in a bacterium is not that different to a synaptic plaque in a central nervous system synapse. Okay, so you have post-translational modification changing proteins, but even more fundamentally, you have uh, uh, the fact that in, in eukaryotic cells, <coughs> Each protein is not made from a single gene, but from a, a number of segments of genes, which are, have to be put together in, to make a, an RNA before the protein is made. And uh, in, 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 all, in most cases, there are, there are multiple, okay, multiple segments which can be uh, combined in different ways, and this leads to large numbers of different products. So uh, here we have... Uh, a, a, a potassium channel, which can be made in, in all of the blue segments, are uh, always in the different proteins, and the uh, yellow and the red ones are optional. This protein from Drosophila is a, is a, uh, has a record 38,000 different forms which could be made. So uh, I guess I'm, I'm running out of time, but let me just, just point out that in the, uh, the, 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 this, this high, highly variable nature of proteins is, is really manifest most, most clearly in the immune system, our human, human immune system, which can make something like um, a thousand trillion, I think it is, different antibodies. And it's, it's achieved by uh, e individual cells making different antibodies by this process of, of uh, genes uh, alternate RNA splicing. 
and then any, uh, any that by chance recognize a, an antigen are then promoted, stimulated to divide, so you make large numbers of that particular uh, antibody. And there's, there's another refinement, which is a hypermutation in these genes, which, again, which is uh, it, by a sort of, uh, like an evolution, in is, is, is uh, uh, highly af high affinity uh, binding is selected. Okay, so just to my last slide, this is not a council of despair. I'm not saying that this... The, the, these, uh, <coughs> these processes cannot be modeled. I'm sure they will be. Uh, and it seems to me that it would be a good idea to try and build hardware that incorporates some of these features. And so for that, with that in mind, I, I put down a, 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 just a few um, points that one might consider. First of all, you need a, a system of computational elements li linking them into cir circuits. That's, that's pretty basic. Then uh, another feature of, of uh, real cells is that connections are not just local, but uh, can be essentially any, between any two components in the cell through diffusion and molecular recognition. As I just, just mentioned, the, the individual components are not stereotyped. They're not uh, all the same, but they're highly flexible and, uh, and capable of a, a very wide range of uh, properties, not only in their activity, but also in the connections. Input and output are, are achieved by highly plastic structures built from the same elements that are used for the computation. And then finally, the network must undergo continual stochastic change, and variants must be then selected according to the performance. Okay, I'll finish there, I think.